Good evening. My name is Paul Miller, and I want to welcome all of our viewers and listeners to tonight's special Yom HaShoah presentation. Before turning to tonight's presentation, I think it would be useful to spend a few minutes bringing everyone up to speed on the work of our Rutgers Center and the special efforts which have been undertaken to date in the areas outside of the medical profession, the main subject of tonight's special program. As stated in the mission statement of our Rutgers Center, it is to assist vulnerable communities, particularly communities of faith, to enhance their safety and their standing in society by improving their relationships with law enforcement, with other governmental agencies, and with other vulnerable communities. The Rutgers Center officially came into existence in September 2017, but it really is the outgrowth of a program that began several years earlier, which was then known as the Rutgers Faith-Based Community Security Program, which followed the lethal terrorist attack on the Jewish Museum in Brussels. But the Brussels attack was not the sole reason for the Rutgers Faith-Based Community Security Program to protect vulnerable communities. The program really began a few years earlier, following meetings between John Farmer and myself, targeted on finding ways to aid communities on the ground in Europe and America that were facing a rising tide of intolerance, including anti-Semitism, as well as outright terrorist attacks. To those people who do not know who John Farmer is, let me give you a brief description of why I worked with him and his Rutgers team to confront the issues facing faith communities. John Farmer was the Attorney General of New Jersey during the 9-11 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. He was one of the authors of the 9-11 Commission Report. He served as Dean of Rutgers Law School and then General Counsel of Rutgers University. He is truly recognized as a leading expert in confronting terrorism and someone I am honored to call a friend. The Rutgers program was therefore an attempt to see if active, on-the-ground support of vulnerable communities could make a difference. Over several years of work, the Rutgers Faith-Based Community Security Program demonstrated that, in fact, interaction with vulnerable communities could help, as John said when our center was announced, to break down barriers and help build bridges between vulnerable communities and law enforcement, vulnerable communities and majority communities, and among communities themselves, is something that is critically necessary. And if there is any doubt about the importance of the work being undertaken by the Rutgers Center today, one has to look no further than the recent attacks on the Michigan State House and the U.S. Capitol. And we, of course, cannot forget other attacks, such as the horror of the killings inside the synagogue in Pittsburgh. One of the few things our Rutgers Center did was form a partnership with the International March of the Living, the organization which for several decades has undertaken numerous programs to keep the memory of the Holocaust, the Shoah, alive, lest we forget this horror of the past. As Santanyana said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. As most of you watching and listening to tonight's program know, I am by training a lawyer. Perhaps because of my profession, but clearly understanding the role that lawyers and judges played in helping the Nazi party implement the horrors of the Holocaust, we joined with the march in working with legal groups, law societies, and law schools in exposing the role our profession played who can forget, for example, the devastating Nuremberg Laws? These past actions and programs undertaken by the Rutgers Center in conjunction with the March of Living bring us to the importance of tonight's special program, the role of the medical profession in supporting the Nazi party and the implementation of the horror of the Holocaust. One way to begin to think through the role of the medical profession is for each of us to try and answer the questions posed by Shmuel Reese at the Center for Medical Education of the Hebrew University Faculty of Medicine. Could the Holocaust, one of the greatest evils ever perpetrated on humankind, have occurred without the complicity of physicians, their societies, and the scientific professional community? How did healers become killers? Can it happen again? As we ponder these questions, there are several facts we should consider. Percentage-wise, more physicians joined the Nazi party than did the population of Germany as a whole. Roughly half of all German doctors became party members between 1933 and 1945. The German medical profession played a role in shaping and implementing many, many, many Nazi policies. Not only did physicians and nurses support the regime, Many became complicit in Nazi crimes. German doctors and medical scientists helped shape Nazi Germany's racial laws. Many participated in forcible sterilizations, human experimentation, 
and the so-called euthanasia of people with mental and physical disabilities. And just as the doctors supported the Nazi regime, so did the nurses as well. In fact, nursing schools began indoctrinating students with Nazi ideology through classes on race and eugenics. The role of the medical profession was so extensive that in 1946, 1947, there was a special trial in Nuremberg known as the doctor's trial. Tonight you will, however, not only hear about the participation of the medical profession in the Shoah, but you will also hear about many other doctors who never forgot their original oath to care for the sick and help save lives in the ghettos as well as in the death camps with names like Auschwitz Birkenau. I would now like to thank our presenters who remind us about the medical evils and courageous efforts of doctors during the Holocaust, our partner, the March of the Living, not merely for tonight's special presentation, but as I said before, for the work they have been doing for decades. The Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust, and a very special thanks to the Jewish Broadcasting Service for enabling this special presentation to be seen and heard over its networks, which serve over half a million people globally. It is now my pleasure to turn tonight's special presentation over to Dr. Stacy Gallen, the director and founder of the Maimonides Institute, who will serve as host of tonight's presentation. Thank you, and please be safe. Thank you so much, Paul, both for that wonderful introduction and for your dedication and commitment to creating a better future by remembering the past. The Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience has been instrumental to the success of tonight's program. We are immensely grateful for their continued support and appreciative of their involvement in creating numerous innovative March of the Living programs that have significantly contributed to expanding Holocaust awareness globally. The Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust was founded on the premise that the only way to truly preserve the legacy of those who perished or whose lives were changed irrevocably at the hands of Nazi medicine is to use the lessons of the past to inform how we can and should act today, to foster a personal and professional ethos that values the protection of human rights and the central principles of ethics first and foremost, and to empower the next generation to understand the necessity of standing up and speaking out whenever injustice is present. The lessons of the Holocaust transcend traditional boundaries. They are international, intergenerational, interfaith, and interprofessional. Holocaust education can and should be universally relevant and serve to promote justice and tolerance, equality, and human dignity for all. During the past year, the world has struggled with challenges that call into question our core ethical values. We are facing a global pandemic that has resulted in proposed modifications to basic moral principles at varying levels within healthcare politics, public policy, the media, and general society. Systemic inequalities that emphasize the hierarchy of human life that has long been present in society have come to the forefront of our debate. At the same time, we are experiencing a troubling rise in anti-Semitism, racism, and other forms of discrimination and hate crimes, as well as a lack of knowledge regarding the Holocaust. At this defining point in human history, we are presented with unprecedented challenges. We must be able to use the lessons of the past, those from another defining point in human history, to inform our actions, shape our present, and create a better future. Just as we must learn from the past in order to address our current issues, so we must learn from each other. Hearing the varied and diverse voices that make up the narrative of medicine, ethics, and the Holocaust, those of the victims, the survivors, the perpetrators, and the scholars, are essential to truly understanding the complex nature of this topic. Weaving together this type of comprehensive approach entails the cooperation of many. We are grateful to our partners at the International March of the Living, the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience at Rutgers University, Teva Pharmaceuticals, and the USC Shoah Foundation for their tireless efforts to promote Holocaust education. We also want to thank each and every person who contributed their voice to this project. In particular, I would be remiss not to mention Dr. David Machlis, Vice Chairman of the March of the Living and Project Manager Extraordinaire. 
David has put his heart and soul into making this program a success, and it has been an honor and a privilege to work with and learn from him. The broad array of perspectives that you will hear over the next 90 minutes will paint a vivid picture of the power and privilege of medicine and the ways in which they can be used for good or for evil. You will hear about the darkest period in the history of medicine, perhaps in the history of humankind, but you will also hear stories about those who find a way to shine their light. And while the challenges and conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic are vastly different than those faced by medical doctors and nurses during the Holocaust, you will hear about how the lessons of the Holocaust have shaped our response to this crisis. While we cannot physically be together this Yom HaShoah, we are proud to stand with our partners all over the world, international medical associations, universities, and healthcare systems, as we look to medicine and morality as a way to reflect on the past and protect the future while appreciating the miraculous work of our healthcare professionals during this global pandemic. I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of humanity. The health and well-being of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not permit considerations of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will respect the secrets that are confined in me, even after the patient has died. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity and in accordance with good medical practice. I will foster the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession. I'll give to my teachers, colleagues, and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and the advancements of healthcare. I will attend to my own health well-being and abilities. In order to provide care of the highest standard, I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even on the threat. I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. My honor. My honor. My honor. My honor. My honor. In January of this year, we, along with the rest of the world, commemorated Holocaust Remembrance Day. Throughout the Houston Methodist Hospital System, we sent out this prayer that was written by Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, Archbishop of Canterbury Justin Welby, and Senior Imam Quari Asim. This was the prayer. Loving God, we come to you today with heavy hearts, remembering the six million Jewish souls murdered during the Holocaust. and the horrors of that history, when so many groups were targeted because of their identity, and in genocides which followed, we recognize destructive prejudices that drive people apart. Forgive us when we give space to fear, negativity and hatred of others simply because they're different from us. In the light of God, we see everyone as equally precious manifestation to the divine and can know the courage to face the darkness. Through our prayers and actions, Help us to stand together with those who are suffering so that light may banish all darkness. Love will prevail over hate and good will triumph over evil. Amen. I am extremely honored to introduce Dr. Albert Borla, the chairman and chief executive officer of Pfizer Inc. and the child of Holocaust survivors and express our deepest gratitude to him for telling his family's story sharing the impact it has had on his life, and reminding us all of the necessity of standing up and speaking out against anti-Semitism and hatred of any kind. Hello everyone, I am Albert Burla. As the son of Holocaust survivors, I'm honored and humbled to participate in this year's March of the Living, Yom HaShoah Observance. And as someone who leads a company whose purpose is breakthroughs that change patients' lives, I'm thrilled that this year's event is dedicated to the heroes who provided medical care in the ghettos and camps during World War II. 
as well as those who provide medical care around the world today. I was born and raised in Thessaloniki, Greece. Before Hitler began his march through Europe, there was a thriving Sephardic Jewish community in Thessaloniki. So much so that it was known as La Madre de Israel, or the Mother of Israel. Within a week of the occupation, however, the Germans had arrested the Jewish leadership, evicted hundreds of Jewish families, and confiscated their apartments. And it took less than three years to accomplish their goal of exterminating the community. When the Germans invaded Greece, there were approximately 50,000 Jews living in the city. By the end of the war, only 2,000 had survived. Lucky for me, both of my parents, Mois and Sarah Burla, were among the 2,000. My father was successful in surviving by hiding his identity. My then teenage mother was arrested by Nazis, abused in jail, and lined up against a wall in front of a firing squad. She was removed from the line of death at the last moment, thanks to hefty bribes that a Christian relative paid to Max Merton, a Nazi war criminal. Many Holocaust survivors never spoke to their children of the horrors they endured because it was too painful. But my parents talked about it a great deal. They did this because they wanted us to remember, to remember all the lives that were lost, to remember what can happen when the virus of evil is allowed to spread unchecked. But most important, to remember the value of a human life. You see, when my parents spoke of the Holocaust, they never spoke of anger or revenge. They didn't teach us to hate those who did this to our family and friends. Instead, they spoke of how lucky they were to be alive and how we all needed to build on that feeling, celebrate life and move forward. Hatred would only stand in the way. My parents' story has had a great impact on my life and my view of the world. But I hadn't really spoken about it publicly until recently. And I'm so glad that I did. Because if sharing their story inspires just one more person to join us in proclaiming that never means never, when we stand up against antisemitism and all forms of racism, then it will help make our world a better place. Thank you again for the invitation to join you today. And thank you for remembering. Stay safe and stay well. It is often said that bioethics emerged out of the ashes of the Holocaust as a reactive response to the abrogation of ethics and the abuse of power on the part of the medical profession. The systematic participation of physicians those who took an oath to first do no harm in the labeling, persecution, and eventual mass murder of millions of those deemed unfit during the Holocaust represents the only example of medically sanctioned genocide in history. To say that the Holocaust was an instance of medicine gone mad is to ignore the ethical beliefs that allowed those sworn to the Hippocratic tenet of healing to become killers. The first segment of our program explores the foundations of Nazi medicine. Most people think of the role of physicians relating to the Holocaust about medical experiments in concentration camps. If it were only medical experiments in concentration camps, its impact would be limited. Uh, the participation of physicians was far more broad and deeply, far more deeply problematic. Let's go through one simple example that may describe a much larger pattern. 
Uh, students of the Holocaust understand the first to be gassed were not Jews. The first to be gassed were uh, physically infirm, emotionally distraught, congenitally ill Germans. In order to kill them, they had to be um, identified in all of the major psychiatric institutions. Physicians had to sign off on the fact that they were, quotation marks, life unworthy of living or something called useless um, eaters. And that is that these people were consuming the resources that should be available to the young, vibrant, vital Germans. Why were they targeted for destruction? They were targeted destruction, first of all, because they were an embarrassment to the myth of Aryan supremacy. And secondly, they were targeted because they were consuming resources that could be best utilized by a society to develop those who were the best and the brightest, the fittest, the most worthy. And consequently, they were eliminated. There were six different killing centers, and the killing itself went from passive means like starvation to active means by the use of sedatives, and finally it culminated in the use of gas chambers. Now, who participated in that? One would have to say virtually the entire German psychiatric community. There are also 28 institutes of racial science, staffed by reputable scientists, at, founded at some of the great universities of Germany, all of them seeking to use science to verify the German claim that the Germans were a member of the master race, that they were inferior races, and that Jews, uh, again, were deemed as life, not only life unworthy of living as for the people, Germans of special needs, but Jews were deemed a cancer on the body politic. The medical metaphor legitimated the entire process of murder and destruction of the Jews, presuming that the uh, Jews were a cancer on society and consequently you were healing by killing. The elimination of the Jews was to bring about the salvation, the redemption of the German people. We are proud to partner with the USC Shoah Foundation this evening, an organization dedicated to using innovative technologies to preserve the invaluable testimonies of Holocaust survivors. The first clip you are about to see features Holocaust survivor and March of the Living educator Max Eisen, filmed in 360 technology in front of the barracks in Auschwitz, where his life was saved by a heroic Polish doctor who was also a member of the Auschwitz resistance. In 2019, as a part of a Shoah Foundation March of the Living project to document testimony of survivors for future generations speaking at the very site of their experiences in 360, Max spent nine days in three countries telling his story on location. This included standing outside the hospital block at Auschwitz I, which will be seen here for the very first time. Future generations will be able to watch this in virtual reality or use their devices and actually when they're standing on this spot at Auschwitz, see Max speaking from this very spot. Um, Max is just picking up at the point at which he describes the fact that he'd been hit around the head with a pickaxe and was brought to this hospital unit um, in order to be able to uh, be, uh, have surgery done. I was dropped in the hallway here and uh... I was operated on next morning. I woke up, I was in the ward upstairs. <clears throat> and uh, two doctors, two surgeons that came up to see the patients the next morning. My head was bandaged. I thought I went to uh, hell and back, really. It was so strange. And um, Two days later, if you couldn't walk away after surgery, two days later you were taken, put on a stretcher, brought up here, there was a truck. You were loaded on and taken to uh, Birkenau and gassed. So as I was brought through the hallway in a stretcher, Dr. Rosheshko, who was the chief surgeon, he was a Polish political prisoner, he took me over the stretcher, 
took me into the prep room of the surgery, he gave me a lab coat, and uh, he told me that I'm going to be the cleaner. He saved my life. I would not be here to tell this story had he not done that. Dr. Ojasko uh, made him an assistant there, and he worked in this block um, as a young man, um, assisting in the surgery department. I think it shows very clearly that there are two different types of uh, medical officer at Auschwitz, those who were carrying out the heinous experiments and those who were using their humanity, a Polish political prisoner who used his humanity um, to save Max's life and give him a chance uh, to recuperate and to convalesce and to live out the best he could in the Auschwitz, um, his life, which of course ultimately saved him. Amidst these tales of evil perpetrated by Nazi physicians, it's important not to forget the stories of survival, strength, and hope. I was fortunate enough to call Eva Kaur my friend and mentor, and her story has been an inspiration to me and countless others. Eva was a survivor of Joseph Mengele's infamous twin experiments. She had one goal in life, and we spoke about it frequently. Eva wanted to share the story of her time in Auschwitz with as many people as possible. She wanted to inspire people to remember, to forgive, to heal, and to create a better world where people treat each other with kindness and respect. The first night I met Eva, I promised to do everything I could to help share her message. Getting to know Eva was, and always will be, one of the great privileges of my life. Although she passed away one year to the day that I last saw her on a trip where we took the Davidson College men's basketball team to Auschwitz together, I'm proud that her story continues to live on through the interviews she gave and the incredible work of the USC Shoah Foundation, one of our partners for this evening. Even though Eva is no longer with us, Dr. Stephen Smith, executive director of the USC Shoah Foundation, was able to conduct a virtual interview with Eva's hologram only a few weeks ago using the innovative technology they have created as part of their New Dimensions in Testimony program. Eva, did you meet Dr. Mengele? I met Joseph Mengele every single day in the barrack and in the labs. And the only day that I didn't see Mengele was on Sunday. And that is the way I knew it was Sunday. And what were the labs like? The lab that we would stand or sit naked, which I call the observation lab, was in Auschwitz one and we would march from Birkenau, Auschwitz II to Auschwitz I, stay there most of the day, and then came back at night. The other lab, the blood lab, was in Birkenau. It was not very far from our barrack, and at the time, they would take in about 30 twins. So it took them 30 sets of twins. It took them quite a long time to finish everybody. Was Dr. Joseph Mengele evil? There was such sadness, anger, such look of disgust and contempt for the people he was dealing with. Did you and Miriam speak to each other about your experiences? Miriam and I never spoke about our experiences until 1985. I tried to speak to her in 1979 after I seen the Holocaust movie. She was not ready to speak about it yet, so the first time we spoke was 1985. Eva, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being here. To feel like a nobody and a nothing, not as a human being, is very, very difficult. But, because my main purpose while I was in Auschwitz is to survive one more day, to survive one more experiment, I concentrated very much on my goals. I don't think that it didn't dehumanize me, it just, I had to somehow put it aside. Uh, to be kept 
naked for eight hours a day and studied and measured every part of my body without any regard for how uncomfortable it was, how dehumanizing it was. I was just treated as a subject to experiment, not as a human being. I don't think there was one single effort to make us feel human. You sit here, you do that, we are going to inject you, we are going to take blood from you. Never any concern for the person who was in front of them. That was automatically done, but in the, in the other sense, this was Nazi medicine. Nobody, Jews and the other people who were dehumanized, were not human beings. There was no effort in their part. We knew that. We were just there to provide the, in this case, father for their experiments. That's all we were. I, what I am finding very difficult for me to understand how any human being can treat an other human being that way. What kind of a sick mentality gives an other human being the right to treat a human being that way? You know, we hear the term Nazi medical ethics, and that sounds like um, an oxymoron, a complete contradiction in terms. And, and yet, there was a systematic uh, ethics um, that was developed within the context of National Socialist Germany. Um, uh, probably best exemplified uh, by a physician named Rudolf Ramm, uh, who wrote literally the textbook um, of Nazi medical ethics. He had three fundamental principles on which he operated. Um, that intermarriage, which he referred to as uh, miscegenation, uh, was spoiling the quote-unquote racial stock um, of the German people that the birth rate uh, among Germans was, uh, Aryan Germans, was declining, um, and that there was, um, uh, and, and that the, the country was being overrun uh, by a group of quote unquote inferior racial types. Uh, and so that his argument was that any ethical consideration within the context of medicine needed to take those three facts first and foremost into account uh, and therefore um, develop policies, procedures, or approaches um, to individual patients that fundamentally supported the health uh, of the overall people, the folk. I think one of the important things for us to remember here is that at the time um, uh, of the National Socialist takeover uh, of, of all the um, uh, organs and, and, um, and uh, uh, operations uh, of German society. German medicine was the most scientifically advanced system uh, in the world. It's where everybody in the world went to study and train. It had a place in world medicine of the time, not unlike what the United States has at this moment. And yet, being scientifically the most advanced system of its time did not stop it um, from descending uh, into horrific moral decisions. Even in the darkest of times, one can always find the light. Stories of physicians who remain dedicated to healing and saving lives in any way possible prove that ethics, virtues, values, and hope can prevail. These tales of Jewish physicians and righteous Gentiles who risk their lives to save others demonstrate how the power of the profession can be harnessed for good, even in the most dire circumstances. We have the incredible example of the ethics of physicians. Some of you know the great story of Janusz Korczak, who was the Mr. Rogers and the Dr. Benjamin Spark of Poland a very trusted pediatrician whose work was internationally famous, and also a man who had a Sunday evening program in which he, like Mr. Rogers, educated the young people and their parents about some of the incredible values. He was a Jewish physician who also became the head of an orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. And they describe his decision to go with his orphans with his children, with the people in his care to go to Treblinka. 
because he was famous, because he was universally respected, they asked him if he would uh, like to escape the ghetto, and they informed him about what the fate of the Jews was going to be in Treblinka. And Korchak said, I'll only escape if you can provide for the children. What about the children when they could not provide for his orphans? He deliberately decided to go with them to board the trains to Treblinka. But he didn't only do it as, what shall we say, as giving up and giving in. He had them march orderly carrying the flags of, that he had created for the programs that he had created. And they marched singing songs. He had two children in his arms and two children alongside him. And they marched to the ghetto and something remarkable happened during that deportation, which is as they marched, the entire ghetto was silent and it understood precisely what Korchak was doing. In Emanuel Ringelblum's diaries, he quotes somebody, a march like this one has never seen. Korchak went with his children. A physician stayed with his patients to the very end. We first have to start with the numbers because the numbers are absolutely staggering. Doctors were responsible and healthcare professionals were responsible for between 150 and 200,000 deaths during the time of the Nazi um, regime. And that's from the barbaric medical experimentation and research that went on from starvation of people deemed unfit, and of course from the euthanasia programs that were prevalent during that time. If the work of the Nazi physicians hadn't been done, they would have never even been able to get to kill six million Jewish persons and the nine million other persons that were murdered in the Holocaust. So the numbers are very important to think about. The way in which the Nazis did that was to pick populations that they knew people felt were disposable, disabled children, disabled or mentally ill adults, then to look to people like the Jews who had already been marginalized, and people like the Roma people, the, um, the, the, the people that no one cared about. It made the physicians feel that they were doing a service to the state, and it put them in a better light in the minds of a lot of people. So now imagine yourself as a medical student in Germany in the early 1930s. Everything you see in the culture is anti-Semitic propaganda, is otherizing people with disabilities and placing stigma on people that are not racially pure. And then you go to medical school and you're sitting in a lecture hall with one of the top scientists or physicians in the entire world. And they are telling you that they have scientific proof that certain races are superior to other races. Now, what are you gonna do? Who are you to question that and would you have the courage? You might feel something like, this is not right, this does not comport with my religious beliefs, but are you going to have the courage and the strong conscience enough to not participate, to be able to say no to that? And not only that, when you get out of that classroom and you walk around, you look around, guess what? All your Jewish colleagues, they're not even in medical school anymore. The Jewish professors that used to teach at your university, they're not there anymore. And so this further isolation and stigma in the culture certainly influenced the way physicians thought about what the purpose of medicine is, and that can't be understated. Now, think about it from the other perspective. Physicians influenced culture, and the Nazis knew this. They knew the power and privilege that physicians had in society, and they utilized that. To paraphrase one of the Nazi administrators, he said, the role of the physician should be one of racial leadership because they knew that if they could get the physicians in their corner, they would be able to, to use that power for their ends. And they had a very brilliant way of doing this. They created not just a simile, but a very powerful metaphor that Germany is a body. Germany is a body, and the body is sick, and it is weakening, and guess what? The disease, Jews are the disease. The Roma people are the disease. People of color are the disease. Homosexuals are the disease. So now, what do you do when a disease is afflicting the body, you isolate it, 
you try to contain it, you suppress it, and if you can't do any of those things, what do you do? You cut it out. You kill it. Now, this is a powerful metaphor that even a lay person can understand, and now in comes the physician. So now, what better way to rid the German body of disease than by bringing in the physician who is trained to rid your body of disease? It was a natural fit with their metaphor. It was very powerful. Dr. Frank Summers is a child survivor of the Holocaust and former refugee whose early experiences compelled him to become a physician. He is also a founding executive board member of Doctors Against Racism and Anti-Semitism, where he leads the Holocaust Education, a medical imperative project. Here, he tells his story. The Holocaust had a profound effect on my whole life and including my choice of career. Having been born at a very unfortunate, tragic time in 1943 in a country which was occupied by the retreating German army in 1943, uh, our family uh, were able to only survive based on uh, not reporting to the ghettos but to go into hiding in the dark, dingy basements of bomb-damaged buildings. Uh, during that time, as many people know and should know, uh, close to half a million Jewish persons in Hungary were deported. That included most of my extended family uh, and, of course, killed. Uh, I have a profound impact on my life as a result of that and having survived and uh, that has been a, a core basic guiding principle in all my choices and it is to this day. Well I set out to try to decide on a career which would contribute to healing and to health and uh, my interest in science coupled to that led me into the path of medicine, first of all. Uh, my colleagues in DARA, Doctors Against Racism and Antisemitism, an organization which we set up about 12 years ago, based out of Toronto, Canada, but has international membership. We uh, are committed to rectify the reality that in most medical education, Holocaust is never mentioned. In particular, we are very concerned with remembering the contribution of fascist doctors in Germany and scientists who from a fairly early stage onwards helped with their knowledge, betraying their Hippocratic Oath to carry out some of the most odious murderous policies of the Nazi Hitlerite regime. This is an unprecedented event in the history of medicine and it, we feel it's quite important that young doctors in training should be knowledgeable about what happened, be aware of the temptation of power, of the loss of moral compass, and in particular to equip them better for dealing with some of the very challenging issues that are coming up in medical care during their careers when they get into practice. The issue we're dealing with in this program is very personal to me. Uh, most of us are getting on in years and most of us who have any direct connection to the Holocaust um, are uh, dwindling in numbers. I strongly would encourage all colleagues in all parts of medicine to carry forward the dedication, the knowledge, the motivation that we now have exhibited in forwarding the reality of the history one of the most shameful, tragic periods in the history of medicine and never allow this to ever happen again, to learn the lessons of that and to renew 
the knowledge that we have and to renew our commitment to the oath that we have taken and to speak truth to power, to remain ethical in our practices and to practice empathy and hopefully do some justice, some justice to all those innocent victims, men, women, children, who had no choice over their fate. That's the least we can do. That is, in my experience, a major lesson in my life of having survived the Holocaust. This past year found our society faced with unprecedented challenges due to COVID-19. Those in the healthcare profession have been asked to put their own lives at risk to save others. They have also been tasked with determining equitable and just protocols for allocating scarce resources, ensuring that necessary and rapid human subject experimentation was performed ethically and with the full consent of those involved. And now they are charged with finding a way to distribute the resulting vaccines to the most vulnerable among us. A distinction must be made between the so-called medical crisis manufactured by the Nazis and the very real medical crisis caused by COVID-19. However, the lessons of the Holocaust, how the power and privilege of medicine can be influenced by external factors so as to place the care of the individual in a secondary role, have informed our current situation as we have struggled to meet this challenge in the most ethical manner possible. What can the Holocaust teach us about the ethics of care during a pandemic? And how can these lessons be incorporated into the development and distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine? The next part of our program explores these questions. The Holocaust is still very relevant today to medical ethics. And not simply in terms of the Holocaust was the starting event or the originator for contemporary medical ethics today. What the Holocaust can teach us is that medical ethics is not simply a matter of doing well and doing good in easy times, but recognizing that the skills that a person develops in their normal course of daily practice are skills to develop and to strengthen so that when a person's environment gets more challenging, when the stakes are higher, when there is more risk to more people, such as in a pandemic, we don't throw our ethics out the window or exchange the ethics and the professionality that we've been developing in quote unquote normal times for a quote unquote pandemic or crisis oriented ethics. The Holocaust can teach us that if we practice what we aspire and if we maintain the values that we continually preach, then we will be able to use those techniques. We will be able to uphold those values even in a time of crisis, even in a time of pandemic. I would like to say that what the Holocaust can inform us is even today that if we don't make sure that ethics is seen as a skill to develop rather than content to know, then we won't have those skills when we need them. We need to recognize that at any time, but especially at a time of pandemic, when the risk to human life is so great, that we're not simply playing a numbers game. We don't want to make sure that we protect the group at the expense of the people that may be at the margins. We want to make sure that every individual life counts, that every individual has the opportunity to live and to grow and to thrive, and that we should invest in individuals, not simply for what they can give to society, but because they are part of a society. The Holocaust was a consequence or a result of seeing people for what they contributed and how weakness of individuals may affect the strength of the whole. We need to see that our strength, that our community strength, is in how we protect people that we see as weak or how we protect people who may be vulnerable and not in how we dismiss them for the sake of our own strength. So my grandfather, Moritz, was born in Lodz, Poland in 1919. Um, he had two loving parents, four brothers, two sisters, and lived a really happy childhood um, in an Orthodox Jewish home. And that all changed in September of 1939 when the Germans uh, invaded Poland. 
They eventually made it to his home city of Lodz, where about 230,000 Jews lived at the time. And by February of that next year, he found himself forced into the Lodz ghetto, where he lived in absolutely terrible conditions. Two of his siblings actually passed away in the ghetto, but he managed to pull through and survive. And eventually, the Germans told him that he would be moved to a Polish farm to work. And little did he know at the time, he was actually being transferred to uh, the worst place imaginable at the time, which was Auschwitz. So when he arrived at Auschwitz, he was separated from the rest of his family and underwent the infamous selection process with Dr. Mengele. While he was in Auschwitz, he was tortured, he was mutilated, he was starved, and he wrote in his memoir that he was immediately forced to take off his clothing and ma march in the freezing cold weather uh, to Auschwitz-Birkenau. I don't know how he did it, but he survived. He worked harder than he's ever worked, and eventually uh, he was transferred to a different labor camp where he worked in a rubber factory. And so when I think of the suffering that he endured during the Holocaust, it makes me want nothing more than to do the exact opposite and to pursue a career uh, that involves healing and human connection and love and compassion. And so in that sense, uh, his stories really did draw me to medicine. And when we look at the Holocaust, we see medicine and science at their very worst. We see just how powerful and destructive science and medicine can be if put in the wrong hands. Zyklon B, which is a cytochrome oxidase inhibitor, it's a, it's a biologically active molecule used and abused to kill millions of people. And it's so disturbing to me to think of a scientist working in the lab using the same scientific method that I'm so passionate about to create a compound that caused so much suffering. The Holocaust continues to shape medical practice, research ethics, and healthcare policy. Ensuring that we never repeat the mistakes of our past must remain a primary goal of individual physicians and professional organizations alike. Next in our program, you will hear from international physicians, one of whom represents the World Medical Association, regarding the essential role of the Holocaust in the history, present, and future of medicine. Well, the Nuremberg trials showed that uh, many German physicians did uh, terrible atrocities towards their patients, uh, not only in concentration camps, but also outside. It started with uh, denouncing all Jewish physicians uh, uh, and uh, taking away their licenses uh, to work. Um, and it ended up by uh, treating uh, whole groups uh, of uh, patients, Jews, Sintis, other people, not as human beings, but um, like animals. One of the founding uh, reasons for the World Medical Association was uh, the Nuremberg Trials. Uh, it was after the Nuremberg Trials uh, that uh, an organization was founded um, that uh, wanted to, to, uh, to write ethical codes that this could never happen again. And indeed, uh, the World Medical Association is the holder of the Declaration of Helsinki, which is the basis of all science with living beings. And it is part of the, um, of the approval uh, at, uh, um, for all drugs and uh, vaccinations all over the world. And the WMA is still owner of this uh, declaration. Uh, and it is very important to, to describe the principles of um, science for physicians uh, when it involves uh, uh, living beings, uh, be it ordinary patients, uh, but also be it people uh, from uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, uh, and I think the Helsinki Declaration is one of the prime uh, documents of um, the World Medical Association. You know, sometimes people ask me this question, why do I teach medicine and the Holocaust? You're not even Jewish. and. I think that's an interesting question. What stake do I have in this subject? Um, and I think it's an important question because after all, most of the world is not Jewish. But I think the questions that medicine and the Holocaust raise for our profession as a whole and our society as a whole are universal questions that go beyond one particular race or religion. 
I think the idea behind teaching medicine in the Holocaust is important because it allows us to focus on the sacrifice and suffering of the Jewish people that both lived through it and died during the Holocaust as a form of remembrance. I think remembrance and understanding the deeper meaning behind that is absolutely vital. And that's why I teach about medicine in the Holocaust. When we use that word and we think about that word, it rightly points us back. We should think about remembrance as a way of honoring those people that have gone before us, and certainly in the Holocaust, the people that suffered at the hands of the medical profession. We should never forget what the medical profession did through its hubris, through its abuse of power. And it's a way of restoring the recognition of the dignity that those persons should have been given in the time. Physicians can learn from their mistakes as much as from their progress. So I do think that that's an important element. Whenever we talk about remembrance, we should be thinking about the restoration of the dignity of the human person that suffered during that time. But I also like to think of remembrance as a way of looking to the future. Remembrance to me points backwards, but it also points forwards. It tells us what the mis about the mistakes that we made, but also about where we can change those mistakes to point medicine in a different direction going forward. And that's crucial. I think that's crucial to my students, and that's one of the things they really appreciate about studying medicine in the Holocaust, is it can light the way towards seeing what medicine ought to be and where we should focus our energies. And really, in my view, that ends up being the dignity of the human person. Your patient always comes first. How do we ensure that never again is more than just a rallying cry? How can we protect against the hierarchy of human life that was created and enforced by the medical profession during the Holocaust and continues to recur in various forms even today? Our next speaker calls on each and every one of us to perform our own acts of moral courage by standing up and speaking out to ensure that history does not repeat itself. There are so many lessons that we can take from the Holocaust. So many lessons that we have to take from the Holocaust. And I think one of those speaks to the way that systemic uh, inequities and disparities continue well into contemporary society. How that happens, who is deciding that hierarchy of value? And then who, most importantly, is accountable? Who are going to be the folks that are vigilantly watching to ensure that this doesn't happen again? And in my opinion, humbly, quite frankly, when we consider diversity, equity, access and accessibility, inclusion and justice as an, as an overarching frame, we have to think very clearly around the ways in which the Holocaust has given us a very clear premise of understanding of the ways in which things can be justified, disparities can be justified, inequities can be justified, marginalization can be justified, the systemic execution of human beings and the snuffing out of human life can be justified. This happened, this is not um, something that is strictly an affect of an emotional state of reflection. It is a horrific reality. And so when we think about the ways in which there is a swelling, right? A swelling, a feverish swelling of, of hate, of structured and systemic marginalization that somehow is justified by some folks in society, we have to make sure that we're voicing our condemnation of this. We have to make sure that we're insisting that we turn back to history to see what has happened and ensure that we will not allow it to happen on our watch ever again. And that takes courage. The courage of many, not just the courage of those who are at risk and most vulnerable for these atrocities. The human body, absent of the human spirit, because of what so many in the medical profession allowed was essentially reduced to economic gain and hierarchy of contributions to a society and biological uh, determinations of what made a person more valuable or less valuable. I believe the pandemic and even the very pragmatic 
suggestions we've had around prevention of the spread of the virus have reminded us just how intricately and integrally connected we all are. That our survival, that our ability to thrive is a collective experiment. It's one in which we all play a role. And when we recognize that there are disparities and inequities that are making for a lack of access or diminishing resources for some of our community members, we have to address that. That can't happen in isolation. We know as evidenced by the Holocaust, as evidenced by other racist atrocities that continue to happen throughout our uh, contemporary history and the like, that we all have to be vigilant. We all have to say something. We all have a responsibility to be invested in the care, in the wellness, in the overall good of each and every one of our community members. And I think the pandemic, as cruel as it has been for us to live through, again, in this collective trauma, because I think that's what it is. And when we're on the other side, we'll look back and we'll be able to identify it as a collective trauma, globally experienced, that we are accountable to one another. We are responsible for one another in some way. And certainly medical professionals and healthcare professionals have a unique responsibility and have done an overwhelmingly good job in doing their very best. But we too are a part of that effort. And I think this was a very harsh reminder, but in the end, I think it will draw us closer. At least that's my hope. From the beginning, Rutgers University was on the front lines of the response to this global pandemic. They worked with hospital and health system partners to care for the sick and conduct research into how the disease impacted healthcare workers. They partnered with the New Jersey state government to launch a contact tracing initiative to track and mitigate the spread of the disease and conducted vaccine clinical trials to speed the approval of our best hope for bringing people back together. Dr. Brian Strom, Chancellor of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences and Executive Vice President for Health Affairs, led the university's efforts to develop better COVID-19 testing methods, which were shared with the world. Due to these groundbreaking efforts, Dr. Strom has had the opportunity to work closely with Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and Chief Medical Advisor to U.S. President Biden. It is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Brian Strom, who will be presenting the Moral Courage in Medicine Award to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Just over one year ago today, the world woke up to the reality of the first global pandemic of our lifetimes. The first confirmed case of the novel coronavirus was detected in New Jersey in March of 2020. And then the days since, more than 23,000 residents of New Jersey and millions more worldwide lost their lives to this disease. Many of us did not understand then the drastic ways our, our daily lives would change, nor the personal and societal toll this pandemic would cause. We are just now gaining some perspective on our society's choices in resource allocation and board policies, the impact of individual patient decisions and our own individual behaviors, the underlying ethical implications of each of these, and with that, our collective responsibilities to our fellow human beings. The sheer global immensity and massive losses of the COVID-19 pandemic were calls for many, both the heroism and the harrowing specter of another of humanity's great crises, World War II. And it is fitting on this Yom HaShoah, the day of remembrance of the terrible events of World War II, that we the living reflect on this pandemic year and begin to draw some lessons on the practice of medicine and public health and the moral obligations of a just society. Public institutions like Rutgers have a unique responsibility to uplift and advance the health of the communities we serve. And as we worked through the ebb and flow of the pandemic surges, we sought direction, leadership, accurate data, and unbiased information, and in no measure, hope, amidst the uncertainty and suffering unfolding around us. We were very fortunate to have one guiding light throughout the pandemic. In an era when public spiritedness and confidence in the disciplines and methodologies of science 
were not held up as virtues of high esteem, Dr. Anthony Fauci embodied both. To our detriment as a society, the public intellectual had been missing from the American scene for quite some time. But Tony became our voice of reason and the beacon of hope for the American public. He provided calm, certitude, and an aura of competence and confidence in scientifically informed public policy. Thanks to his leadership, he has had a newly described phenomena named after him. I can attest that at Rutgers, like at universities around the country, applications to all of our health professions and biomedical schools are up across all sectors. And this is known as the Fauci effect. Further, he had Brad Pitt portray him on Saturday Night Live. These are honors few of my scientist colleagues can possibly boast of. But as we learned in the past century, science is a great tool for public advancement, but also can be manipulated for political and sometimes diabolical ends. Science must always be an objective arbiter of facts. The answers it provides will not only not always be the most popular, may demand hard choices and sacrifices, and may mitigate against the forces of complacency and inaction. I am proud of my colleague, Dr. Anthony Fauci, for his outstanding public service in this very challenging role. He set and continues to set an example for all of us across the health professions to uphold our honor, duty, dignity, and ethics, and hold fast to our core principles and belief in the scientific method. So on behalf of the International March of the Living and the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics in the Holocaust, we are proud to award to him this award for moral courage in medicine, presented to Dr. Anthony Fauci for shining a light through the darkness, providing leadership and hope, and using morals and medicine to heal the world. Congratulations, Tony. It is with sincere humility that I accept this great honor you bestow on me, not only for myself, but on behalf of the countless practitioners of medicine and the healing arts whom I have been privileged to walk beside throughout my professional life. During this past year, we have witnessed unspeakable suffering caused by a terrible pandemic. However, we have also seen thousands of men and women of great moral courage caring for the sick and the dying with compassion and love risking their own health and sometimes even dying as a result of their unselfish work, other times suffering from unbearable stress, from feelings of powerlessness, from hopelessness. We recognize them as heroes and we all remain in gratitude for their sacrifices. At this time of Holocaust remembrance, we also remember those millions taken by unspeakable evil, whose voices nonetheless speak to us across time. It is important we never forget, not just because evil has not been vanquished, but because virtue and goodness must always remain strong in us. Many centuries ago, the great rabbi, physician, and philosopher Maimonides understood this and taught it to others. Medical practitioners around the world have long been inspired by what we call Maimonides' daily prayer of a physician. This prayer, written by a German scholar more than 200 years ago, expresses the timeless teachings of Maimonides and asks of us, just as Maimonides taught, that we remain humble that we live our lives and practice our art to serve others, that we respect the dignity and worth of all human beings, and that we serve not only individual patients, but all of mankind. Maimonides reminded us that goodness and evil coexist, but that we are free to choose one over the other. I believe that the healing arts lie on the path of goodness, the same path all of you have chosen in remembering and listening to the voices of those who perished in the Holocaust. May all of your voices be heard today and in the uncertain but always hopeful future. Thank you again for this great honor and may your good works continue to inspire us. 
I'm truly honored to speak after Dr. Anthony Fauci. His tireless dedication to fight and defeat the COVID-19 pandemic while displaying an unwavering commitment to scientific rigor and best practice is an inspiration to all who play a part in this global battle. I am Dr. Eran Harari, clinical lead in neurology and psychiatry of the research and development group at Teva Pharmaceuticals. As a physician who treated Holocaust survivors and as a family member of first and second generation survivors, I am deeply humbled to represent Teva in the March of Living ceremony, which despite being virtual is still an immensely important and moving tribute to victims and those who survived, perhaps more so after such a momentous year. As a psychiatrist, I have always believed in the human spirit and its limitless potential, but still was time and again amazed by the stories of the people who experienced this unprecedented event in the human history. Austrian psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl is a timeless testament to the luminous tenacity of the human spirit. His 1946 psychological memoir, Man's Search for Meaning, is one of the most vital books ever written. The gruesome experience of Auschwitz taught Viktor Frankl about the primary purpose of life, the quest for meaning. For Frankl, meaning came from three possible sources, purposeful work, love, and courage in the face of difficulty. And this quest for meaning is what drives us at Teva. Teva is an Israeli global pharma company now celebrating 120 years of service. A core tenet of our mission is and has always been to provide access to critical medicine for patients worldwide. And we are privileged to be able to reach and serve with our medicines nearly 200 million people every day. The challenges of COVID-19 have affected us all. For Teva, as a company with a leading role in the US, this meant keeping our plants and labs working around the clock and around the world to ensure an uninterrupted supply of those essential medicines. In Israel, we were honored to partner with the government and distribute millions of vaccine doses to hundreds of endpoints, helping to ensure one of the world's fastest and most efficient vaccine rollouts. Another contribution we are particularly proud of is a unique collaboration with two organizations, Unistream and 8400 in a scientific entrepreneurship project involving the children of medical staff working around the clock in hospitals across Israel as they fought on the front lines of the pandemic. These 200 children worked in team on technological solutions that would ease the burden on medical staff and patients and provide better tools for coping with the disease. The project entitled Biotech Next Generation introduced youths to the realms of health, medicine, biotech, and entrepreneurship and provided the tools they need to establish their own groundbreaking startups in the future. Some of the winning solutions were particularly suited to support senior citizens, among them Holocaust survivors, who have experienced great difficulties in isolation due to the characteristics of the pandemic. One example is a device that would allow patients to disconnect themselves from IV infusion so they can move around freely, potentially improving the quality of life for many elderly people. Efrat Rosenhaft is a member of the design team for this innovation. Efrat's father, Yair Rosenhaft, is an internist nurse at the Tel Aviv hospital, and Efrat's grandmother, Malka Bennett, was born in Czechoslovakia and brought to Auschwitz along with her three sisters before surviving and moving to Israel. Malka takes great pride in Efrat. Another example is of Dr. Zandberg, who is the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors who lost most of the family in the Holocaust. While she was working day and night treating COVID-19 patients in the emergency room, the young children of her colleagues developed apps and tools to help people like her grandparents. Among those solutions was an app for connecting those in quarantine and isolation during the pandemic that provides mental support, activities to pass the time, and quick access to experts. Yet another was a tool that allows seniors to talk to each other, listen to lectures, call for volunteers, and enjoy their environment in a convenient and simple way. This is a living example of passing down from generation to generation, midor le do in Hebrew, the moral commitment to help others and care for the community. As Teva's lead in this project, working with these bright kids and seeing them bring such original solutions and unending energy to this unprecedented challenge filled me with hope that this generation has what it takes to ensure that past generations and their sacrifices will not be forgotten or left behind.
Arch of the Living alumni from all corners of the globe who are all working in the medical profession, dedicating themselves to the health and welfare of their patients. We come together tonight to light these candles in honor and memory of the victims of the COVID-19 pandemic and the medical professionals who sacrificed their lives to care for their patients. We also pay homage to the medical professionals who in the midst of the horrors of the Holocaust continued to honor their oath to heal and to provide comfort. I light this candle tonight to honor the nearly 2.8 million people who have lost their lives worldwide to COVID-19. I light this candle in honor and memory of Dr. Ernst Morch. Dr. Ernst Morch was a member of the Danish resistance credited with saving gold with 500 of the country's 7,000 Jews. Among other things, at a time when the Gestapo was using bloodhounds to sniff out Jews hiding under the false bottoms of fishing boats carrying them to safety in Sweden, he and a friend perfected the mixture to disable the dog's ability to smell. Dr. Ernst Morch is one of almost 300 Gentiles recognized as righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem, Israel's National Holocaust Museum, for risking their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. We light this candle in honor and memory of Dr. Adelaide Haas Hortwell. Dr. Adelaide Haas Hortwell, a French physician and psychiatrist, was born in the village of Lahawald, where she worked in the home for disabled children before the war. Hortwell was arrested in 1942 when she traveled to Nazi-occupied Paris to attend her mother's funeral and was jailed in Bourges with a number of Jewish prisoners. She was transferred to Auschwitz in January 1943, where Chief Nazi doctor Edward Wirths asked Hortwell to practice gynecology. She agreed until she discovered that medical experiments were being performed on Jewish women with the intention of sterilizing them. In Auschwitz, Hortwell was known as the saint because of the medical care she provided to Jewish prisoners in secret. She told a fellow prisoner, none of us are going to get out of this alive, but so long as we are here, we must behave like human beings. She was named Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem in 1965. I light this candle in honor and memory of Dr. Elchanan Elkis. Dr. Elchanan Elkis was a Jewish physician from Kovno. During the war, he was chairman of the Kovno Ghetto Jewish Council. Before he was transported to a subcamp of Dachau, he was placed in charge of the camp hospital. He died in the fall of 1944 after a hunger strike, having refused to participate in the camp selections, abiding by his medical oath to first and always do no harm. I light this candle in honor and memory of Dr. Benedict Zemilski. Dr. Benedict Zemilski was a prominent Lvov doctor with a respected medical practice. He also worked in a hospital doing scientific research to combat hypoglycemia and pulmonary diseases, especially tuberculosis, which the German company Bayer expressed interest in. In 1942, Dr. Zemilski and his family tried to escape by train to Warsaw. He was arrested at the Lublin station and taken to Majdanek. The family never saw him again. Among the letters that arrived in his Lvov apartment after his death were two letters in German, one from Majdanek informing the family that Benedict Zemilski was dead, the second a short letter from Bayer referring to an important component of a drug invented by Dr. Zemilski. In effect, one German letter recognizing his brilliance, the other letter announcing his murder. I light this candle in honor and memory of Dr. Franacek Pavel Rysheja. Dr. Franacek Pavel Rysheja was a Polish orthopedic physician and academic teacher. On July 21, 1942, he went to an apartment at Klodna Street 26 in the Warsaw Ghetto to take care of a Jewish patient, where he was murdered in the apartment alongside his patient, Abe Gutenayer, his family, two Jewish doctors and a nurse by the Gestapo under the command of SS Sturm von Fuhrer Hermann Hoffel. Dr. Franacek Pavel Rasheya is recognized as one of the righteous among the nations in Yad Vashem. 
Dr. Gisela Pearl was a Jewish gynecologist and Auschwitz survivor who cared for her fellow inmates working with virtually no tools, no anesthetic, and little help. Dr. Gisela Pearl saved hundreds of Jewish women's lives by performing abortions on the pregnant woman to saving them from the gas chamber. She ultimately opened her own clinic in New York dedicated to helping women with infertility, including those very same Holocaust survivors she made in camp, delivering some 3,000 babies. Every time Dr. Gisela Pearl entered a delivery room, she stopped first to pray, God, you owe me a life, a living baby. On behalf of the International March of the Living, the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust, the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience at Rutgers University, and in cooperation with Teva Pharmaceuticals and the USC Shoah Foundation, we pledge the following. We cannot look forward to where we want to go by turning our backs on what the world leaves behind. Our collective past the voices of those who survived to tell their children and of those who perished, whose voices rise from the earth, will serve as our call to action. We are committed to protecting those who survived, their lives, their stories, their legacies. We pledge to create and provide a comprehensive educational platform that transcends the traditional boundaries of Holocaust education. We will reach out to broad and diverse audiences ranging from health professionals and social activists to students of all ages and experience. We will build bridges where there are currently boundaries, open doors of friendship and solidarity that are currently locked shut. We are committed to expanding Holocaust education from examining history to changing the present and the future. The lessons of the Holocaust will serve as the paradigm for how we can both turn away from evil and do good. We will provide education not only in the areas of medical research and public health, but in all areas of human interaction that emphasize dignity and respect. We will ensure that Holocaust education teaches anyone and everyone to see individuals for all that they are, rather than simply boxing them into a category of race, tribe, or creed. Never again is no longer enough. We will empower emerging leaders to guide us on a new path where we strive not only to never repeat the mistakes of our past, but to preserve the legacy of those who perished during the Holocaust and to create a better future. Tonight's program has emphasized the absolute necessity of educating the world about medicine, ethics, and the Holocaust. Its relevance and implications for modern society are simply too important to ignore. Therefore, we are extremely excited to collaborate with Teva Pharmaceuticals to provide this type of high quality, accessible education to people all over the world. We have learned the importance of reflecting on the past to protect the future, but this can only be accomplished by working together with like-minded individuals and organizations that are willing to act now. We are grateful to Teva Pharmaceuticals for giving us this opportunity to partner with them to bring the lessons of medicine, ethics, and the Holocaust to a global audience. Our closing musical piece will be the theme from the critically acclaimed film by Steven Spielberg, Schindler's List, composed by John Williams. The moving composition will be performed by Miri ben -Ari, a Grammy Award-winning violinist, producer, humanitarian, United Nations Goodwill Ambassador of Music, and third generation to Holocaust survivors. Her grandparents escaped the Holocaust coming to Israel from Poland. She is the CEO and co-founder of Gedenk, an organization dedicated to promoting Holocaust education for youth. Shalom, this is Miri ben Ari, the violinist, also a third generation to Holocaust survivors. I like to say that when we're out of words, there is music. And so I am proud to perform for you today the theme of Schindler's List in a memory of my family that was murdered in Poland and the six million Jews. We shall never forget.
As we conclude this evening's program, I would like to introduce Phyllis Heidemann, President of the International March of the Living, to provide our closing remarks. Throughout time, men, women, and children have put their faith in medical practitioners for the diagnosis, the prognosis, prevention, and the treatment of medical problems that they face. We historically turn to the medical profession for answers on questions revolving our life and our death. Our will to survive drives us to search for the answers to good health and long life. Toward that end, we turn to doctors and to nurses. During this symposium, we have learned about the diabolical use of medicine during the very darkest period of the Holocaust by the most devious minds in modern times as an alternative use of medicine other than the preservation of life. We mourn the passing of so many of our martyred ancestors who surely may have made life-saving contributions in so many fields, including medicine, had their lives not ended so viciously and so needlessly in the prime of their lives. And we recognize the bravery of so many medical heroes, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, who resisted Nazi tyranny often at the risk of their own lives and the lives of their loved ones to help strangers in the camps, the ghettos, forests, and in the shtetls. We have heard firsthand testimony of the exemplary commitment of today's medical community as together, the provider and the recipient, we face head on the COVID-19 global pandemic. Through in-depth explanation and detailed interpretation from our extraordinary presenters, I hope we each leave this program better informed, a little wiser, and perhaps a bit calmer on how we can face this ongoing new, ever-changing, always challenging, and still unfamiliar future which lies ahead. Challenge is not new to the human race, and yet, Challenge of the unknown remains daunting to the thoughtful of us on matters on the heart, the soul, and the mind. We at the March of the Living have devoted much of our time and our effort over the last three decades since the inception of our organization to the meaning and the importance of life, the value of the contributions we make to our community, the meaning of the memory of the legacy of our ancestors. We have done so with vigor and commitment to the next generation and with a vision for the continuity of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. And I dare say with an eye to the, a better future for all humanity. For these reasons and for many more, we are proud to dedicate the 2021 International March of the Living to the men and women who selflessly and bravely devote their time and their energy to conquer the health-threatening COVID-19 and any future global pandemics we may be forced to face. On behalf of all of us at the International March of the Living, the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust, the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience at Rutgers University, and the USC Shoah Foundation, we thank you for joining us for this educational symposium. We hope and pray that each of you, your families, and your colleagues remain well during this uncharted times in which we are living, and that the future will be a brighter and a safer one for all. Let us strive to learn the lessons of the tragic history of the Holocaust and combine our efforts in the fields of medicine and morality for the benefit of all humankind. We wish shalom, we wish peace, and good health to each of you.